So the conversation today is where do human rights begin? Um, I, I, this is a big question and I'm trying my best not to be all over the place, but um, one could say that human rights begin with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or with our various countries' constitutions and their Bill of Rights. Another person could say that perhaps um, human rights stem from various religious scriptures, um, maybe the Bible, the Quran, um, but essentially someone, people somewhere decided what is wrong and what is good, right? Someone decided that, and, and somehow this language and these decisions became universal. So across nations, um, you can find commonalities in what we, we, all, we all deem to be a human right. Um, I think we can all agree that um, there's a shared understanding of what, of how life should be experienced. Um, and, and it's been brought about by documents that outline what basic human rights people are entitled to, right? So mine is to say what happens beyond the written text of what people's human rights are. So it's written in the constitution, and then what? It's written in the, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then what? At what point do we ensure that the written text becomes a lived experience? Because for me, that is where human rights begin. Human rights begin when the majority of the people are able to live those rights. A paper that says, I have the right to shelter, I have the right to medical, what, what, I have the right to live when men are raping and, and killing women in South Africa, that means nothing to young women in South Africa. But the moment that we can ensure that we can, we, they, they can walk in the streets of South Africa and feel safe, that is when they're truly living that human right. That, that is for me when that human right begins. Well, I'm very passionate about young women. And one, this is because uh, youth make up 35.1% in South Africa. 8.8 .8 million of that youth is women, whilst 9.4 million are men. So in general, young women are a significant demographic in our country, right? Two, the UN Sustainable Development Goal 5 on gender equality recognizes the fact that many households across the world are cared for by women. Therefore, it is by this that I believe it is important to ensure that women are given the necessary skills and knowledge to be active participants in the economy. Three, Women for have for years suffered under triple oppression. In South Africa, we suffer under race, class, and gender. Um, and it's about time that we change the lived experiences of women. Um, and so when I look at the South African documents um, that spoke to Fees Must Fall, so now, okay, stick with me. So I said young women are important to me. Then I told you a story about, about how we wanted to ensure that um, young people, particularly those of the black community, particularly those that are proletariat and part of the missing middle have access to education. So, so education is important to me and young women are important to me. So for me, it's important that young women have access to education so that noting who they are in society, noting their vulnerability in society, they can change the realities of their lives. And education in South Africa is by the constitution of South Africa, uh, section 29.1 of the con Constitution contains the right to a basic education and the right to a further education. B, to further education, which is university, which the state through reasonable measures, which could be free education, must make progressively available and accessible. This was the basis on which we said the government must make higher education free to those that can't afford it. So I find the Constitution doesn't say to further education, which the state through free education they said through reasonable measures. That's reasonable measures. That can be free education. That can be so many things. So we said it truly is free education. Um, and I think that's the issue. It's like written text as well. It can be open to so many interpretations because they would say, yeah, but we have uh, loans. But we said, no, but um, that's not a reasonable measure. Free education is a reasonable measure. So that is a way in which we used this written text to bring to life human rights, so that young women don't have to be subjected to inhumane conditions where they can't be independent, because we're well aware of the fact that gender-based violence manifests itself in so many ways, including economic um, uh, dependence, right? So 
Increasing access to education allows us to give independence to young women, for them to be able to also actively participate in the economy and compete against their male counterparts and be better than them, actually, most of the time. Um, and so um, this particular part of our constitution is actu actually finds uh, origin in a text that was used during our liberation movement called the Freedom Charter, which stipulates that education shall be free, compulsory, universal, and equal for all children. So that's basic education, high school and primary school. Then it says higher education and technical training shall be opened to all by means of state allowances and scholarships awarded on the basis of merit. So state allowances, surely that's free education. So when we went to speak to our ruling party, we said, you guys were at the forefront of conceptualizing this document that you're so proud of called the Freedom Charter. And in the Freedom Charter, it says, will be made available through the means of state allowances. So surely the state allowance is free education, like, hello. So, I mean, these are ways in which we took this written text and said it needs to breathe life into the realities of many young women. This failure of our states and of governance is not because we don't have bright minds. It's not because we don't have educated people. So we always speak about the right to education, basic education. So we can go about and speak about the right to basic education and give kids amazing um, education on science and technology and how to be the best engineers. But if those kids are gonna grow up to be adults or graduates who are amazing engineers and have the amazing skill to be amazing engineers, but when we as government give them a grant to build a bridge, they, they, when we give them, let's say, 100 euros to build that bridge, and the kids, and that now not a kid anymore, graduate engineer, amazing engineer, takes 30 euros to build that bridge, then we've not achieved what we wanted to achieve through the education system because then we have unethical engineers, which means in, in a year's time, we're gonna be building, we're gonna be patching that bridge up again. And that's the crisis of which we have. We need ethical beings because the, the success of our governments is not on how much funding we put in, is not on how, how great uh, infrastructure we build, it's not on how many times we, as members of parliament, change legislature, it's on good hearts. It's on people doing the goddamn right thing. Excuse my French. Thank you very much.